Welcome to this tutorial today where we are going to be doing a brief summary of the life cycle of our red blood cells or more formally our erythrocytes and we will briefly cover many uh, processes in this video so if you would like further detail on any of these I will mention the name along the way so that you can look at my tutorial on that particular part. So let's get started here. Our red blood cells, the oxygen carrying cells within our body. To begin to produce these cells we need to zoom into our bone marrow because this is where we will start. And like with any cell we don't just automatically develop the cell type that we want. We need to differentiate first from a stem cell. So our multipotent stem cells within the bone marrow will differentiate into proerythroblasts. And proerythroblasts are the first cell type dedicated to becoming a mature red blood cell after they have fully developed. So we have our proerythroblast here and the proerythroblast is going to further differentiate first into an early erythroblast and then into a late erythroblast and we can separate these two based on what they are doing. So if I put a picture of both of them up, we'll see that one of them has a small nucleus and one of them has a slightly larger nucleus. So we'll make this one the early erythroblast and it's going to be doing a lot of ribosome synthesis. But within our late erythroblast we are going to see hemoglobin synthesis become the main priority. Hemoglobin being the oxygen carrying component of red blood cells. And this kind of makes sense. If we remember back to uh, the basic cell structure, our ribosomes are the intracellular machines which generate proteins. So we obviously need those before we can begin to generate hemoglobin which contains proteins. So I've just drawn a ribosome here generating the amino acid chains required for globin synthesis and after our late erythroblast has been producing hemoglobin for roughly four days we can refer to it as a normoblast. It begins to look more like the red blood cells that we recognize but it still has a nucleus. Now the normoblast at this point can essentially eject the nucleus because it is no longer required. All of the machinery to finish maturation is there and this step makes red blood cells are very special being the only cells in our body without a nucleus and if we think about the red blood cells purpose for a moment which is carrying oxygen well then the reason why we get rid of the nucleus is fairly straightforward we basically pack the cell with so much hemoglobin that there is no longer room for a nucleus. And once we get rid of the nucleus, we refer to the cell as a reticulocyte. And if we have a look at the reticulocyte here, we can see that it almost looks identical to a mature red blood cell now, but it has these strange blue dots and these blue dots are due to ribosomes. The reticulocyte only has around 80% of the hemoglobin of a mature red blood cell, so we need to continue production. And that's going to be for roughly another 48 hours, and that will still be in our bone marrow, before the cell is finally mature enough to enter circulation into the blood. So we're going to be entering circulation now, and let's just uh, pretend this is our blood vessels. And after just another 24 hours of maturation while in circulation, the reticulocytes become fully mature erythrocytes. So we have a couple of erythrocytes or red blood cells here within our circulation. And these are going to carry oxygen around all over your body for roughly 120 days before they begin to die. And the reason your red blood cells have this uh, expiration date so to speak is due to their lack of a nucleus so in the red blood cells case we sacrifice longevity of the cell for oxygen carrying efficiency. 
So now we have cells that are 120 days old, some of them beginning to lose membrane structure, so looking a bit odd, and others just simply falling to pieces. So either old, which accounts for uh, roughly 90% of our red blood cells, or damaged, which accounts for the last 10%. And such damage could be due to many factors. So either of these uh, fates, old or damaged, will lead to either intravascular or extravascular hemolysis, which we'll cover more extensively in another tutorial. But for now, let's assume your cells have made it the full 120 days intact. And our macrophages of the spleen will sense that their membrane structure is not quite right anymore, so they will phagocytose them for breakdown into a few different components, which we can either remove or recycle. So we'll have most of those macrophages within the spleen, but we'll also find them within the liver and within the bone marrow itself. So we are within a macrophage of the spleen here, and we are breaking down this red blood cell and want to recycle as much of this hemoglobin as possible because all of these biomolecules are precious, so our body does not want to waste them. So first our macrophage will separate heme from globin, and our globin will simply be broken down into amino acids, but our heme is a bit trickier. We break that down into iron, so Fe2, and biliverdin. And biliverdin is further broken down into bilirubin. Now our iron and amino acids are going to have a separate fate to that of our bilirubin. So at this point in the red blood cell life cycle, we can simply transport the amino acids and iron back to the bone marrow again, noting that we need transferrin, an iron-carrying molecule, so that we can transport the iron. And once we are back at the bone marrow, we can recycle these biomolecules in the process of erythropoiesis, or making new red blood cells all over again. And in terms of our whole red blood cell life cycle, this would usually be enough information to know, but for our purposes here, let's not leave things unfinished and find out quickly what happens to our bilirubin. So to remove our bilirubin, we must transport it through the blood bound to albumin, one of our plasma proteins, where we will eventually reach the liver. And I have some of our internal organs drawn here. And once we arrive at the liver, the bilirubin will enter the bile duct and be transported to the small intestine. And once we are in the small intestine, we'll have a bacteria break the bilirubin down further into urobilinogen, which can then either be eliminated through feces or reabsorbed into the blood, in which case it will eventually reach the kidneys and be eliminated in urine. Now we have the uh, stomach drawn here as well, and we aren't going to be able to recycle these biomolecules infinitely, so let's just talk for a moment quickly about the food products that we will need for effective red blood cell production. So we're going to require foods in our diet that contain things like vitamin B12, folate, iron, and amino acids as well. And now that we've gone through our whole life cycle, we can see that our red blood cells are very tightly regulated. And if you'd like to know more about any particular part of this process, I have more detailed explanations in other tutorials as well. I hope this summary video has been helpful to you. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.